be another. Uh, a focus on education certainly is uh, one. Uh, if I can certainly provide a model that uh, I think comes out of a, a notion of stewardship and and looking towards education. And it came up in one of our discussions that we were having. Um, if we go to LA, and we're all familiar with the uprising I think that happened in the early 90s uh, in the Crenshaw neighborhood. Well, uh, in uh, Crenshaw, at Crenshaw High School, after the uprising, for example, the students at, uh, and people who had certain expertise in the neighborhood uh, developed a model to further education. Uh, students adopted a lot, a vacant lot. They began to garden on the lot. Persons, uh, again, in the neighborhood, residents who had skills in biology, uh, chemistry, worked with the students. Two things happen uh, as a result, uh, or through this process. Approximately 25% of the food that was uh, produced was given uh, to uh, food banks and other uh, needy persons in the uh, community. The second thing that happened was uh, this was seen as an opportunity for uh, students to develop skills. Uh, produce was sold and a uh, farmer's market was developed. Uh, the students went on to develop a salad dressing. Uh, uh, and it was called Food from the Hood. You may have seen it. Uh, it was sold in over, uh, and even today it's sold in over 2,000 grocery stores spread out of the dark uh, is the subtitle. Uh, and on Amazon.com. So as they begin to develop these skills, they also put some of the funds in a trust where uh, students uh, as managers, students who work as managers to end this operation, um, had funding to pay for their college education. Uh, to date, approximately $250,000 has gone towards scholarships for those who worked uh, uh, in, this, in this operation, and also turning around funding uh, and helping the homeless. I mean, this is a wonderful, I think, example. Uh, and there are other examples that we can use across uh, from other parts. where we see uh, sustainability, and stewardship, um, and action. Uh, I think to build on Jeffrey's side of stewardship, sustainability happens in some ways at two levels, a micro and a macro level. You need to take care of yourself on a local um, sort of um, awareness, but like sustainability and like the environment, or realize that there's a larger global effect at play. And I think in communities like this, one of the things we have to realize is even as we work hard on what is happening locally, that we have to also realize there's a larger world out there. And in order for us to remain relevant, we have to be willing to tap into that world and have that world tap back into us. Otherwise, we're like an island floating out there and not able to move with the change or affect change. And I think. Um, this experience sort of comes from growing up on an island where you know everything's important, everything comes in. And I remember when globalization was the big word back in the 90s. Everybody in Barbados was trying to figure out how are we going to survive in this big world? What is it that I'm going to do as an entrepreneur that's going to work in this locale? But I know that I need to be make, taking advantage of more than just what I can earn here. What can I earn? Where can I have relevance out there in the bigger picture? And so I think sustainability is about recognizing micro level, understanding what it is that you have macro level, making sure that what you have is, can contribute to the world outside and bring that world back to you. So 
Patrick says, make little plans. Jeffrey says, make no little plans. But what you guys have really been describing is the interconnectedness of the small scale and the large scale and the impact that the small actions have on the general situation. So we have here a, a kind of a community, I'm talking about the Houston community, where in general, controls of uh, land use are minimal and developmental practices are maximal. That is, uh, you know, anybody who has an idea of, of how to utilize a piece of land to increase their income is, you know, have a go at it. So it's a kind of a difficult environment, especially in terms of you know, the kinds of things that Jeffrey was talking about implementing. Uh, I hope that in coming years we'll be able to do some of this. Well, let's talk for a minute about uh, what we're here for, which is Project Row Houses and what kind of a uh, catalyst it has been in planning and development in this neighborhood. Uh, over the years, they, they early on when lots were low cost, $5,000 and up, um, they acquired land, and as, as Rick said last night, these two blocks were actually donated to Project Row Houses. And uh, they partnered with uh, Midtown uh, Redevelopment Authority to do some of the uh, housing and other sites. So uh, some ideas which start with students, like student ideas, little tiny incremental ideas, Patrick has been able to implement the students, and we've been able to implement the students, uh, have a kind of uh, uh, evolutionary breakout in terms of being able to be uh, proliferated if the land exists. But now the land is $50,000 a lot, not $5,000. So it, it becomes incrementally more difficult to do that. Not just incrementally, monumentally more difficult. So, um, I think the road has been very successful in being a catalyst for this kind of, uh, of, of providing an example of how uh, uh, land use development can occur and keep the, the kind of uh, vernacular character of the neighborhood, as I just said. But going forward, that becomes more difficult. I mean, there's the fewer pieces of land available and the, the remain, remaining land is very much so, what kind of, where do we go from here? I was thinking about this last night, and um, you know, when you can't afford the land, there's still the city stuff around it, right? And and there's all lot, you hear a lot these days about sort of guerrilla gardening and things like that. And I, you look at the property that's around me, but in some of it's very derelict. But the question is, can you can you have an impact along that street edge, along the road, and start making the difference there? Um, encourage folk to then purchase the land that you that we as a community, third world community, is kind of set up an understanding of how they want this space to develop. So when you can't afford it, you have to find the ways and the scenes that you can get it. And to me, if I was going to do something, that's what I, that's what I was thinking. It's like create the beautiful frame, which then the picture can be painted and laid on. Well, I, I think we have to also realize that the transition from uh, $5,000 lots to $15,000 lots is not, is, has not stopped. It's, it's, it's a trajectory, and we're in the middle of the trajectory. Well, we may, not, we may not be in the middle, but we're in, within the trajectory. Uh, and we have seen a, a community that existed when the land value was that low, but it was a community that was in, uh, in, in, in trouble. And I think what we're looking for is instruments to try to uh, reweave the fabric of the institutions here uh, with the land price today and projecting how the land price in the future uh, will be part of that. Uh, a community uh, that is relieving can support a, uh, a school.
school, a public school, that should support a public school, and not only by the resources within itself, but from the city at large. And we know that one of the most important resources here in this community is just a few uh, blocks to the, to the east of Ryan Middle School and the previous incarnation, Jack Gates, or Senior High School. And that, even as it has transformed into a magnet that you now have to apply to, and it's able to draw students from across the city, it's still a resource that this community values. And the, uh, okay, okay. the uh, so the, that uh, institution belongs to the equation uh, at this land value. And likewise, uh, the Emancipation Park that we talked about last night, directly across the street, is another kind. It's going to be another kind of magnet. It's trying to shift from the community mark. Um, it's um, uh, relatively tranquil right now. After a, a, an enormous investment into a, a park that could be a magnet for people city life and also a magnet for land development all the way around it, including right where we're sitting. And um, so Project Row House is, is going to have to factor in this kind of uh, attraction that we ourselves have created here. By uh, incremental moves, all of a sudden it's going to cascade into a much more monumental uh, uh, magnet for the rest of the city. So there's the, the danger of being kind of co-opted out of all of this. I thought it was best that I could last. Because I could be kind of long-winded. A long-winded professor. Some might argue that the name professor. But that might be another panel discussion. The deconstruction of Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, <laughs> certainly, uh, Project Real House is this big great strides with his allies taking an incremental approach. Taking an incremental approach. I believe the time may have come where we need to begin to think, being thoughtful about uh, being more involved in uh, policy development for the community's benefit. And I am focusing on uh, uh, values of equity, sustainability, and stewardship, and recognizing the importance of housing, and that we need permanent housing that's a, affordable for lower income households. The best, I would argue, and maybe somewhat radical, but um, <coughs> the best model that I think that allows that for me is the community land trust model. There's some examples pulling from across the country. Uh, we have probably the one that's most well known uh, in terms of success might be uh, the Champlain Housing Trust, which is in Burlington, uh, Vermont. Uh, now, you know, Burlington, right? Uh, the land of freedom and community. Bernie Sanders, our sole senator who, uh, who is neither Democrat nor Republican. Um, so, you know, the, the understanding the political, economic context that one works in, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important. And so under this model, uh, they've been around for 25 years. They've created approximately uh, 5,000 uh, units of housing from renter to single to dash to condo development. <coughs> from market rate to lower, they also, to lower income uh, housing. 
Uh, they also have um, economic development uh, initiatives uh, that are part of this uh, model. Uh, they have uh, work, particularly for artists, they have uh, worker housing space um, that's, uh, and it works. There are other places across the country uh, that I think that you could also uh, consider. But I think this is an opportunity to really get to uh, a critical issue in the third ward, and I think that's permanent, uh, affordable uh, housing. Thank you. I, I think we've, you've done a very good job in setting the stage for both the opportunity um, in this neighborhood and the concern that the stakeholders um, will continue to have a significant role in place. So with that, I think we'd like to open it up to some questions and let, uh, let you ask uh, some questions and let the panel respond. What I mean by permanent affordable housing is that, uh, and we know that affordability changes and it depends on who you're talking to, for whom, who's it affordable for whom, if you will. But what I mean is that uh, there are mechanisms, and CLT is one, that will allow for those persons who are very low income to always have shelter. Okay. So, so um, in our in our past uh, in Third Ward, there have been such dwellings as you described it remind me of um, public housing, like human homes, okay. which used to be a stepping stone toward other housing, but it existed there for people who needed it, ideally for a short time, as they moved into other kind of rental situations, and maybe eventually home ownership within the geographic neighborhood. So does that factor into what your concept is of um, permanent affordable housing? as a stepping stone toward other kinds of housing within the neighborhood? Not necessarily um, in the respect that uh, public housing, while it should be valued, and, and certainly in this country we've seen the demise of public housing, uh, public housing is one in which uh, one receives a subsidy to live there. Under the uh, certainly community land trust model, there is no public subsidy. And in essence, what happens under the community land trust model is that the community, a community based organization, holds the land in trust. They, the community owns the land. So, in most places, what we see around the country, if the community owns the land, that cuts housing costs by at least a third. And so the person, so you own the house, the structure. You don't own the land in which it sits. That's, that's where the community comes into play. And I, I suggest that it does, by, by removing the cost of the land and making the house affordable, that's where stewardship really comes into play. Because uh, by that house remaining affordable, 
when the homeowner or household is ready to move on, it provides another opportunity for someone else to live there. If they choose to move on, it provides another opportunity uh, for others, for others to live there. And that, it kind of harkens back to, um, I would say, the model 30 years ago, because in many of our communities, whether one was a homeowner or a renter, there was long-term residency, which helped to build community. And today, by following, particularly by following the market approach, where the financialization of housing has now turned the house into an asset, an exchange value, rather than a use value, our communities are turning over rapidly, much more rapidly. There is no commitment to community. It's all about building wealth. The stewardship model turns that back on its head and incorporates some of the things that have been passed to help to build the community. Can I ask you to clarify? Uh, the, my understanding is the community land trust and the housing trust uh, does require municipal uh, action. The, the city government would have to empower that community project. Like, is that correct? Do you understand? Well, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, yes, uh, there is um, you know policy that certainly has to be set up that helps to support that. That's what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. So, so I, I'd like to offer the the, the perception that as uh, as the third board goes, so goes the city of Houston. And that solving the problem in this neighborhood is, is about solving it here, but it's also about solving it in other parts of Houston that face many of the same things. Uh, I was very pleased to hear uh, last night Rick recount uh, his exchange with Paul Winkler at the early moments of founding the Project Row Houses. Uh, we're working on a, a hypothetical assignment of my students right now that causes them to assess the process of creating uh, the uh, Manila Collection community. And I, I perceive that there's a direct parallel, that it's a, a vision brought into a setting where there's uh, disparate resources that sees value in collecting those resources, bringing them under some level of common control for the long term. And there certainly has been price, market price escalation in that neighborhood as well. And I think we can see examples where properties that were purchased early on were at a very affordable price. Those later properties were much more difficult to acquire at a much higher price. So I think it's a parallel process that's taking place here. Do I have my time? We have some questions. And by the way, somebody stop us if we're running over time. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, hi, so I've been thinking a lot about the transformation of the landscape here and the roles that the students had in that transformation, what it was like for them to come here and work. And do I need to stand up? Are you sure I need to stand up? I can see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> So yeah, I'm thinking about that, but I'm also wondering what that transformation meant for them personally. Um, because the, I'm thinking of this transformation of the landscape, them, them making these buildings and thinking about who and for what. But I'm wondering who those students were, what were their, you know, what demographics they come from, where they come from, and, and what it meant for them to, to be involved. Um, and you can even maybe give like kinds of assignments or things that you may have said to them to get them thinking about the, the relevance. But yeah, I'm really interested in the students here. Well, um, I'd like to just say that uh, Patrick's design build studio has gone on relatively the same time as Bryce, and we've shared a lot of ideas. For our students, I'll just open this up by saying that many of them have chosen careers um, in community service. They've uh, gone on to work for in other communities in other cities. Um, some of them have uh, committed many years to uh, operations um, like 
Brian Bell's design for. And so for them, I think it makes them see that, um, of course not all of them, but many of them, it makes them see that the design process, as Rick said, is fluid. Um, as architecture students, sometimes they draw a plan and they think that's it, that's the finish, that's the end. And I think what they realize when they actually have the responsibility of building it, um, that oftentimes there aren't enough resources, uh, that uh, there's not enough uh, time to get the, a certain uh, material. They have to be resilient in the field and regroup and re-evaluate uh, a detail that might have been beautiful in a drawing, but very, very hard to execute. So um, Project Girl Health is for our students. Has, it's given them the opportunity to test their ideas. And one thing that I know is true, because we've heard from so many of them who have worked on our projects and are now in architecture firms all over the place, is that it makes them understand the collaborative process. That um, it makes them understand the importance of, say, the person in the field building this thing. And when they're asked a question, um, you know, they're no longer just going to say, well, look at the drawing. They're going to say, I understand what you're saying. I understand that you might have a better idea on how to do this. So let's think of it. Let's talk about it. So I do think that um, it's opened up that perspective. And just a little quick note before we give Patrick a chance. Um, Project Row Houses itself, the 22 shotgun houses, uh, and how what they are urbanistically, that is these little tiny, very, very simple cellular units that just get repeated, but have a much larger importance by how they uh, interact with the street and interact with the backyard and the communal spaces and how they uh, and they have this kind of multi-functionality changing uses uh, adaptability uh, and sustainability for different uses has been an enormous lesson because instead of you know trying to invent the kind of you know the grand scheme there's the appreciation that sometimes greatest solution is a very, very simple and repetitive solution that has um, significance beyond just what the little piece of it is. If I understand, I'm not sure I've heard the first part about which transformation you're referring to, but if, if I understand your question, I'd like to refer to one project that was done by an undergraduate uh, collaborative, collaborative class uh, at the University of Houston. This is uh, really an outgrowth of our graduate design build studio, and we now have spawned a, a new initiative called the Design uh, Build Collaborative, which brings together architecture students, and in this case, graphic design students, both from the university. There was an exhibition that we were, uh, we were invited to create uh, with collaborators uh, Carol Parrott Blue and members of the Lyon Middle School community, learning community, faculties, uh, staff, and students. And uh, it was a short live uh, exhibition. It was intended to be about a three month exhibition. And it actually stayed much longer, but it was a way for us to, uh, we, as we understood it, a way for us to participate in building the uh, respect for the identity, the existing identity of the community and the value of those historic uh, assets. Not to prevent transformation or evolution, but to mark